Hello Ice Supply fans, this is Wally from Supreme Ice Supplies. If you're a beginner ice supply keeper or an intermediate keeper and you want to make sure that your ice supplies are being kept as healthy as they possibly can be, or you just want to see more babies, this is the video for you. Stick around and I'll share the three things I wish I would have known when I started keeping isopods. The Isopod Vlog On the Supreme Gecko YouTube channel, I strive to try to give you as much information to help you keep your animals as healthy and productive as you possibly can, whether that's geckos or isopods. I know when I started keeping isopods about two years ago, I looked all over the place for information from the internet to going to reptile shows and talking to other breeders. I just gathered as much information as I possibly could. I absorbed everything that I could, but I had tons and tons and tons of questions. I found other breeders and I bothered them and bothered them to try to get that information as best as I possibly could. Now after keeping isopods for a couple of years and really having some success with some really difficult isopods, I'm going to share with you three different things that I wish I knew when I started keeping isopods. And stick around until the end because I might just throw in a couple of extra tips as well. Let me first say that there's going to be some tips, some pointers that aren't going to be in these three that you should already pretty much know. The first is research. Before you get any animals, whether it's isopods, whether it's geckos, whether, whether it's any other animal, make sure you do the research. Go online, there's so many different resource sources like Facebook, there's so many different groups like for isopods that you can go out there and ask a question and get a really, really good answer for. Go to reptile shows, find breeders, ask them questions. Before you begin purchasing any isopods whatsoever, before you collect your very first isopod, make sure that you ask a lot of questions. And certainly I feel, and I hope you do too, that this uh, YouTube channel can provide you with all kinds of information on keeping isopods as well. So do your research. The second point that I won't include in this video is substrate is so critical to isopod care. You should really already know that before you even begin keeping isopods. If you start with the right substrate, it puts you way ahead of the game. I have a couple of videos that I'll go ahead and share up here on building your first isopod setup and how to make the substrate. So hopefully that will help. And the third tip that I really won't cover too much in this video on is don't start with a lot of different species all at once to begin with. Start with three or four instead of five or 10 or 20 or more. Go out to the wild, collect some isopods, set them up, make sure you understand the whole process of keeping isopods, get two or three different cultures from a breeder or a reptile show, play around with them, get your feet wet, make sure you understand the basics of keeping isopods before you build up a collection of 20 or 30 bins of these isopods. So let's talk about the three things I really, really wish I knew before I started keeping isopods. Number three is that there's only a few different ways to keep isopods. I had so many questions in the beginning. How do I keep this species? How do I keep this species? How do I keep this species? Begin with some basic beginner or intermediate isopods to begin with. Don't start with the very high end isopods and you'll be fine. There's tons and tons of information out there on dairy cows or powder blues or zebras or clown isopods. Start with some of those and you'll be fine. Make sure you nail down the humidity requirements, ventilation requirements, what types of foods that you need to feed, and how moist you need to keep the substrate on just a handful of those uh, isopods and you'll be set with all the others. There's a few isopods that like to burrow and need a deeper substrate, but most isopods only need about two to three inches. When you're starting out, watch your temperatures because some isopods like it a little bit warmer, some like it a little cooler. So the basic care will be good for 90 to 95% of all the isopods out there. Now certainly that excludes the Porcelio, the large Spanish isopods because they have different requirements and it certainly excludes the Cuberus, the rubber duckies and that whole genus. But again, get your feet wet with some of the basics first, nail down the requirements, make sure that you get them set up the right way 
and get them to start breeding and you'll be all set with most of the other isopods. The number two item on my list of things that I wish I knew when I started keeping isopods is that they don't require a lot of different foods. I was so worried when I started out to make sure that their diet was the right diet and really isopods need a couple of things. One, decaying leaves. Two, decaying wood. Anything above and beyond that is simply additional supplements to their diet. In every setup, we make sure that we have the decaying wood and the decaying leaves, but once or twice a week, we also supplement with just a handful of other foods. Most specifically, the Supreme Isopod Shell, but we also feed uh, fish food. We feed dried minnows. I like to feed the crusted gecko diet once it dries up and I can scrape it off the dishes and put it in the isopod enclosures. I really enjoy feeding mushrooms. They just love, love mushrooms. And of course, we use a lot of vegetables, such as pumpkins and squash and zucchini, carrots, anything that we can find in bulk. Make sure you wash them off or even peel the skins off and you'll be all set. I've enjoyed the last month or so going out to Facebook and Reddit and other places and finding out what people are asking if they can feed their isopods. I'm going to throw up a real quick list right here. I got a kick out of this list. I hope you do too. Before we move on to the number one thing I wish I knew before I started keeping isopods, let me throw in a couple of honorable mentions in here. Number one is don't overfeed. I like to keep springtails in all of my enclosures so that they can take care of some of that excess food, but they can't do everything. Just like in an aquarium, you can have other fish to help take care of the bottom clutter, such as uh, Coriodorus and other catfish and Tuicos and algae eaters but they can only do so much. You really have to manage your amount of feeding that you're doing to your isopods so that you don't start developing mold or have other issues. If you're feeding once or twice a week and you see some mold start developing on uneaten food, go ahead and pull it out. Make sure that that doesn't spread into the rest of the enclosure. And here's a really quick, very important tip. A new enclosure will have everything that the isopods need in that enclosure. They don't need a lot of supplemented food. As well, you're going to have way fewer isopods in that enclosure than you will in two or three or four months once they start breeding and, and having babies. So I feed a lot less food in the first couple of months of keeping isopods than I do after a few months. Here's my second honorable mention item, and that's to sterilize everything. Here's the three B's. Bake, boil, or bag. I do quite a bit of my collection from nature and I'll go around collecting pieces of wood or leaves or moss or something like that. Now when you bring it home, you can take one of the three different methods to sterilize that material. You can boil, put it into a big pot of water and boil it for a while. You can bake it, put it into an oven and bake it for about 20 to 30 minutes at around 200 to 220 degrees. My favorite method though is to throw it in one of those black garbage bags tie it up, throw it out in your backyard, let it bake in the sun for about a week. That really helps kill everything that you could have in that material that could contaminate your isopod enclosure. What are some of the things that could cause problems? Well, the number one is ants. Number two is spiders. And for me, number three is millipedes. Huge problem. I had a whole container of isopods almost taken down because I had a infestation of millipedes in the enclosure that I didn't realize. Again, when you're collecting from the wild, make sure you take one of the three methods and sterilize your material. Bake, bag, or boil. And now onto the number one thing that I wish I would have known before I started keeping isopods. Months ago, I went into one of my isopod enclosures and found that I had far less isopods than I began with. This was Porcelio species Sevilla, and I had received probably about 60 of them from the breeder that had initially sent them to me. 
They were really doing great. I was getting plenty of mankind. They were doing just fantastic. And then I started seeing less and less and less of these isopods in that enclosure. And I finally figured out why. I had an infestation of another isopod that was overtaking that enclosure, was out competing the Sevillas. And that was a big problem. Luckily, I only got down to about 20 or so of these Sevillas, and I was able to reestablish a culture and they're breeding again. Very, very fortunate. Another problem that I had when I first started keeping isopods was that once I got to around 20 isopods, different cultures of isopods, I had different sized tubs and some would have different ventilation holes. It was just a smorgasbord of different enclosures. So here's my tip. If you're going to start with two or three or four different isopods, reconsider and think of the possibilities that you might have 20 or 30 or 40. 50 or like I do right now, I have a hundred different enclosures for isopods. So try to make those enclosures as consistent as you possibly can. My suggestion is to start with about a 15 quart enclosure. Make sure that it's latchable on both sides and make sure that it has a seal so the, that the isopods can't get out of those enclosures. Very, very important. In the case of the Sevilla, I had an enclosure above them that actually had powder blues get into the Sevilla and that's what took them down. So think ahead, plan big. You might have more than three or four enclosures. You might have 40 or 50. Plan the space that you're going to keep them at. Plan the enclosure size that you want to keep them in. And make sure that you can have the proper ventilation for those isopod enclosures and consistency. Now that I have so many different isopod enclosures, I probably have six or seven different types of setups going, and that really makes it harder to work with and less consistent. I'm going to go ahead and throw a link in the description on a couple of tubs that I've used in the past that really work for me. Hey isopod fans, if there was a tip or two that you think will really help you in keeping your isopods healthier and maybe even producing more babies, let me know in the comments below. If there's a tip that I left out that you'd like to give other people, somebody that's beginning keeping isopods, go ahead and throw that in the comments too. I hope this video helps, and if you like this video, hit that thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed yet, please subscribe. Hit that notification all. Thank you very much for watching.